talking to Luke Ford earlier today, and he uh, kind of put the fear of God in me a bit, suggested that maybe one of the reasons I've, I've been asked to uh, speak about the biggest challenges facing Jewish life today is that uh, the implication was that he was one of them. Uh, I, hope, I hope that's not the case. Um, and uh, as much as uh, I hope that, uh, you know, Shakespeare said, jesters oft prove prophets, but uh, um, I'll do my best today. Um, the challenges, I think, uh, like the way we talk about challenges in the Jewish community all too often um, reverberates in the context of crisis. Um, it's been one of the um, one of the themes of the 20th century Jewish experience is galvanizing Jews behind the cause by emphasizing crisis, sort of the way that Fox kind of puts us on orange alert. So I'm glad that the question was framed as you know challenges as opposed to the crises because um, because I think that, that 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 it's just important to be conscious of that trope in the way that um, the way that historically we're we're um, we we consistently feel that one crisis replaces the next and we have to panic. What's the thing to panic about now? What's the thing to galvanize the whole world? I think the two big, I mean, the two biggest challenges I can think of, and this goes back to a conversation we actually started having Thursday night at, at uh, Selwyn Gerber's house um, over dinner. Um, over the dinner at his home back in Los Angeles. Um, and it's two questions that I guess, um, frequently get asked in opposition to one another, um, but only, I think, really make sense when asked together. And those challenges are, like, who who will be Jewish, I guess, in the future? And, and what will Jewish mean in the future? And I think what we, what we found by talking about this the other night is that people tend to stress one question at the expense of the other. The, um, and they kind of need each other. Um, the who will be Jewish camp tends to emphasize things like you know, statistics and the you know, 2001 survey and breeding and, and lose, loses track of, um, you know, loses track of the bigger questions about what this thing will mean um, going into the future um, in an effort to protect, to make sure that you know, there are people who are actually um, living it in the future. We, um, I think without the, what, without asking, um, you know, the emphasis, I guess, on statistics and numbers and populations and demographics, without the what, the question of what Judaism will really mean in the future, um, when it's weighed down by this, like, language, at least this, like, talk of breeding and numbers, and um, it's sort of, um, you know, it leaves open the question, like, why do, why is it, it, it ignores the fact, like, why this tradition is important down to the future. It just makes for an existentially kind of vacuous condition. We had this one story in the magazine about um, a couple of years, a couple of uh, issues ago called The Secret Life of uh, Polyamorous Jews. And it was a story about these um, Jews who insist on multiple Jewish partners multiple loving Jewish relationships and we were you know we the author of this story contextualized the phenomenon um, as a kind of extension of the logic of um, Jewish continuity and this emphasis on reading and numbers and um, I thought that was kind of this is kind of interesting and the, the other part of the equation is that what will you know what will Judaism be um, uh, without you know the question of um, are, without bringing into the conversation our specific kind of mission, our, um, and just kind of, I mean, I was I, thinking about another article we had in this interview with Shmuley Bokeok, where he, he said that Judaism was becoming the Buddhism of the contemporary era. So it's almost like, just like the way that this, um, the way, um, the emphasis purely on Jewish values kind of loses track of the specific um, Jewish mission um, and becomes enervated as a result. So I guess, you know, something I've been thinking about the whole last couple of days going back to our conversation. And um, I guess that's where I, I, I'm sorry, I would start.
Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Great, Josh, thank you. Arnie, you're up. Can I borrow your notes? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a couple of things by way of opener. Firstly, everything that you said was, was very interesting and thoughtful. Um, you know, for me, the most interesting piece of the Jewish story is just the notion of the Jewish people itself and the extent to which, uh, in, in, a, in a rather astonishing way, we're capable in each generation of not only reinventing our sense of self, but reinvest, in reinvesting in the idea of Jewish peoplehood and what it means to be part of this moving enterprise. Um, I, I would say that in a kind of ontological sense, we thematize our own existence. We've created as Jews a working poetic metaphor that keeps us going. I mentioned to a co-facilitator today, I don't want to say who it is because it's um, self-effacing for both of us, and it's fair to do to me, but not to he or she. Um, you know, I, I said, I'm, I'm sick A of hearing my own voice and tired by all the learning, at the same time, of course, invigorated, and we were both blown away by everyone's capacity to continue to learn through lunch, through dinner, till two in the morning. Um, that's a re remarkable, remarkable story. Um, I think that we're at a very positive place in Jewish history. I don't think there was any point in Jewish history where people believed in whatever it is we're supposed to believe in any more or less than now. I think we have always been a very complex, multifaceted, um, difficult, if not annoying people. <laughs> but the idea that somehow this is a unique crisis is in some senses, and as, as everyone knows in the room, in other respects, it's entirely familiar. Um, the growth and explosion in Jewish study, in arts, in culture, in cool things happening. Um, it, it's hard for me to be concerned in the, the negative sense of the word, but rather excited by all the new avenues and discoveries of a Judaism um, that, that's never been identified before. This ability for all of us to speak to each other in this setting, in the ways that we do, is remarkable and deserves a shehechiyadu. That you have you know, fur-hatted people singing with female rabbis last night in the guitar is a Shehechianu moment. Um, so I think that there's, without being Pollyannish, and I'm usually quite cynical, I think that we're living in a remarkable period where actually everything is possible because of our access to re resource and intelligentsia and um, young thinkers Terrible. It's probably the first time I had to say that about a co-panelist, like as if I'm not the young one, but <laughs> someone else is. <laughs> That's a Shafiano. Some are better than others. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that without, over, without overstating it, everything is possible. And I think the greatest challenge is for Jews to stop being so self-conscious about our own future, um, obsessed with outreach, forgive me, and rather um, head over heels with our potential and possibility and commandment to build communities that are worth being part of. Um, David Solomon said earlier, reminded us of the prophetic notion of Orla Goyim. I think we need to rediscover what that means to have enough confidence in ourselves to build communities. And by that, I don't just mean institutions, but build communities where others will look and say, that is how the world is supposed to function. That is how society is supposed to look. And yes, I'm describing a kind of utopic vision. Why not? And if, if not out, and not us, who else? So I think we have every capacity to create a utopic vision of how people live together, learn together, study together, love together, do for the world beyond ourselves. Um, and now I'll turn to my much better looking colleague, Clyde. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good actually because Josh was talking about being polyamorous and Anna was talking about being polyamorous. So Clyde, we look forward to which polytheism you have. Okay, I'm going to be polyfillerish. No, that doesn't work. Again. That doesn't work. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Um, well, I, I, this is the Limud experience, really, because I came to be in the audience, and now here I am on the panel. I thought I'd come and find out the answer, and then I'm being called upon to, to give one. Um, so let me start out by saying, I suppose, uh, having had very, very little time to reflect on this, um, that uh, my first concern is I think there are probably too many Jews. I'm, I'm worried about that. <laughs> um, 